have is uh, I was just wondering whether you also have. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I was just wondering whether you have like thoughts about uh, like like the uh, Hashgraph Madeira scheme, like what they yeah. did with uh, virtual voting, and what are like the pros and cons compared to uh, Avalanche. Sure. 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 So um, my. Um, so my, ex my, my understanding of Hedera is on a very basic principle. Uh, stuff outside of it, I don't really understand much. I understand that we have this notion of councils and so on, I don't really know much about that. But the underlying engine, um, it looks to me very closely, and I'm pretty sure it is, um, a, a slightly modified version of PBFT. So the way that they build this, uh, this DAG, but really all that's building is a, uh, uh, um, sort of a timeline, a vector of the clock, of all of where the messages have been passed, which all it does is that it creates a linear sequence of message transmissions over time in the network, but it's still all to all. Um, that's all that graph is building. So it's effectively an auto classical system with, uh, with the linear sequence over time of message passing encoded in every transaction. So it does, it's not scalable, it's obviously is the end result. It can, I doubt it can go to more than 100 nodes. Th th didn't they publish this week data that on testnet? 10,000 trend, uh, uh, what would they publish some testnet transactions? I mean, that's, that's what they claim. Uh, I guess like what, like what you said, it's very hard to kind of get, like, be convinced about. Uh, like the uh, data from their testnets, for example, maybe they have like the testnets, they all have it, like they're seeing, like, like sure, 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 yeah. Et cetera. I mean, I'm very convinced that they cannot scale to a large number of nodes. But if you had a small number of nodes, I would be surprised if they weren't reaching 10,000 transactions per second. Actually, that's sort of a failure on their engineering part. Uh, because we have had Paxos, for example, running in data centers, Chubby, which runs on uh, Google. Uh, these things are running at hundreds of thousands of transactions per second, and they're not much different. Um, and they've been running for decades, like this, not decades, but many, many years. So we have these systems. They actually do perform at these level levels. Uh, Visa in the back end almost certainly uses a version of Paxos. Um, so these are these are all things that already exist. So if they're not reaching 10,000 transactions per second, honestly, that's a huge failure on the engineering part. Um, it should go to those numbers, but the number of nodes absolutely cannot pass more than 100, I would say. And that's so that's an empirical evidence based on other systems of, of similar constructions that have been that have tried to go to more than 100 nodes. That guy over there would know very well. Transaction size, Stephen. Uh, oh. the, let's go with the, the, the avalanche DAG, the, the uh, 7,001. Uh, it's the same as a typical Bitcoin transaction. So uh, typically, it's one input, two outputs. Uh, so it's probably about 200, 200 bytes, 250 bytes. Yeah, and with full signature verification. No signature verification is about 16,000, something like that? Without, it's uh, 19,000. 19,000, OK, great. So how could you store like a video? Video? How how would you decentralize content storage? Not, uh, I mean, yeah, I that. Would you push that to Filecoin or, or IPFS or something? I mean, it depends on what kinds of requirements you want, right? If you do, if you if you just want like a few nodes to maintain it, you may want to just use like a Tor. Uh, sorry, not Tor. Uh, use Tor type system. Uh, that's probably the best way to decentralize content. And we've had BitTorrent for many many years, and it works pretty well. So there are no there are no blocks to store like tags. And how do you do like you like batch these transactions? Yes, yeah, so every, every, like every vertex in the DAG is actually a batch of about thirty, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's about thirty transactions per so it's sort of like a mini block per, yeah. per vertex. Yeah. And it's how you do virtual machine sizing of virtual machines. Uh, the sizing of the virtual machine? Yeah, like versus that we talk about complex computation within the transaction. Yes. Yeah, those those will one hundred percent reduce the TPS. If you have very complex computation, then no, this is this is clearly the case. Yeah. Um, although I will have to say that I, I personally speaking, I do hope that we sort of move away from the EVM. It's a great system for what it's designed initially what it was supposed to do, but it really cannot scale. Uh, it's not a it's not a very robust, very scalable virtual machine. So we need to do something that uh, better. Wasm is an alternative, but we'll see. Yes. How fast in terms of speed? Off. Uh, in terms of speed, how fast is per transaction? Per, in 
Which 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 system? So the for example the the full Bitcoin type uh, script payments uh, to uh, uh, one input two outputs right um, is about seven thousand. Yeah. And this is with full ver with signature verification. Um, turns out the bottleneck here is exactly signature verification. So if you have multiple cores, this this goes up. But we ran out of cores here. Yes. Um, is there a way you can prevent? Uh, is there a way to prevent? Uh, you know, from voting both like red and blue, for example? No way to prevent it, but it doesn't matter. They can vote either way. So a Byzantine node, for example, can vote anything. Blue, red, yellow, black. So um, you can vote any, uh, any choice. You can vote any choice. If you're correct, you don't, you, you, you follow the protocol. Is, so if there's no penalty, like if you vote for like... We don't have slash it, no. There's no penalty if you, if you incorrectly vote for red, for example. As long as you just follow the protocol, you will converge towards one decision, no slashing. But there is slashing somewhere else, right? Um, we have slashing, we're considering slashing in linear chains. Uh, I am anxious about sh slashing. Um, if, I, if I were a, a user of the system and a bug caused my funds to be slashed, it seems like a really dangerous thing. So this is more of like a philosophical choice at this point for us. Uh, we have to really consider the, the benefits and, and downsides of slashing. I actually don't think there is that many benefits to slashing, as far as I can tell. Well, you're uh, determining good nodes and, and, and Byzantine nodes sure, by. but the full point of, of, of uh, uh, fault-tolerant distributed systems is that it does not matter what a fraction of nodes do. They can, they can act in any way. I will still do the right thing as, a, as an aggregate set of nodes. So I don't really need to punish those few set of nodes that are misbehaving. Um, and uh, by doing this, I also prevent any weirdness with like software bugs, which cause correct nodes to be slashed. And I'm really worried about that. So um, it's really a philosophical question at this point. Um, and uh, there's benefits, pros, and cons to each. Yes. Uh, what I mean is, there would every node be uh, incentivized to vote for every single choice? Yes, you burn fees and active participation. Oh, so you, you burn fees. Yeah, yeah, you, you burn fees. Vote. No, you burn fees for every transaction that is that is um, finalized. So you want to finalize transactions basically the same way, uh, but it's slightly different in Bitcoin. In Bitcoin, you get the block reward, you also get the fees per, per transaction. Whereas here, the, the block reward exists still, yeah. um, but the fees are not given to the, uh, to the creator of the block, they're actually burnt completely. So it's sort of distributed across everybody in the system. So you, you burn something wherever you make each block or you don't finalize something? Whenever you finalize something, yes, you burn, uh, you burn some money, correct. But then, so, so in order to get rewards, then uh, the amount of uh, block reward has to be more than the amount of... Yes, yes. Of and it needs to be, in fact, we're calibrating, you know, like this is the vulnerable parameter, so it needs to be, inflation should be at some particular target, uh, which is basically the amount of new coins that we stake minus the amount of fees that are burned. That is a target number of new coins per year, which is basically inflation per year. So this is governable, and it should hopefully be around 2% per year. First year might be slightly higher, like seven, ten percent, to incentivize um, the new nodes for coming in and, and grab rewards and as the system is constructed. And do all the nodes do they uh, kind of decide when this certain block gets finalized at what threshold, whether it's like a majority or like two thirds, and then they decide to go to the next block? Effectively, our decision um, um, criteria is if you see um, a vote for, let's say, red. For beta, we have a very local beta. For beta consecutive rounds, we finalize. And we give you the full beta. That's that's all. That's the entire criteria. So you can the higher this beta is, the, the stronger the guarantee is, but the higher the beta is. Yeah, this beer. This beer's gonna spill. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we use Pratonos on this event. What's the topology of the network like? Um, this is 20 uh, locations on AWS, geo-distributed. Um, with um, the ones that are within the same data center, with those we, we create sort of uh, simulated latencies. So we make, we make it look like everybody is completely distributed across the globe. And we have this large matrix that we got from somewhere. It's of like some several dozens of uh, of locations with their similar latencies. And we basically just sample from that distribution and we create the artificial latencies within the yeah. And does the topology affect the component 
we look at this as well? And yes, yes, yes. This is a great question. Um, so this is fully connected network, um, which is uh, which is reasonable because the staking chain in Ava tells you who the latest set of stakers are, mm -hmm. so you can have a full set of stakers. Um, but we do have simulations. Uh, you know, I actually have like very sort of primitive simulations in Python of um, more uh, disconnected networks. Um, of course, yes, the performance goes down. In fact, also the safety guarantees go down if the network is very you know, randomized and sparse and stuff like that. Um, but um, it can be well characterized. I never got to the chance of like fully characterizing well that number, uh, but um, um, it, it's actually easily computable. I just never sat down and looked down. So. Yes? Uh, I guess just like following up to my question earlier, like initially, since we don't know what the distribution is, we can like the two colors, like the, the snowfall and the snow. Yeah, 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 yeah. How does that play into whether like, the correct decision is made when the fact is being captured? Right, okay. So um, it's this beta, this magical number beta, which comes in. It's this number of consecutive things. Basically, let me put it this way. Um, let's suppose that everybody here has a color. Uh, on the forehead, but I can't see what everybody is. I'm, I only randomly see some people at a time. Um, if I do, if I randomly sample some of you, three of you guys, and I see every single time that three of you at random are red, I see again in the next round that three of you are again red, I again three uh, are red, and I do this for beta consecutive <coughs> times, um, the math tells you that it's very, very, very unlikely that you have actually anybody that's blue in the system. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, think I understand that. I think my question is, what, like, it, it's pretty clear that you will actually first be one color or the other, but it, doesn't it beg the question, like, which one of these colors was the actual correct choice? But, uh, I see, see, in binary consensus, um, there is no such thing as the correct choice. It's either zero or one. So I have two choices. Um, I can also have the case in a real deployment where Alice, um, let me see, maybe Alice pays Bob, but Alice does not exist, it's an invalid transaction. It never had any funds. To begin with, when I send this transaction to the network, everybody says no, immediately. So this will never get finalized by anybody. Um, I'm, only assume, I'm only talking about the case where Alice pays Bob and Alice pays Charlie, both individually are valid, but both together, are invalid. This is binary consensus. Yes? No, I'm actually, I'll let someone else. Okay. Uh, actually, what I would say is, um, you know, that certainly is important to me because it's a you know, massive, let's say, uh, retail transactions. But with the example you made for insurance in Williamsburg, for instance, yes. the number of transactions is very limited. Sure. Yes. So how would I mean, this would be a massive efficiency that your system gives with necessarily support for something as localized as that. I, absolutely. For yeah. that localization, I, yeah, I agree. If you're, if you're in the dozen of perception second, I don't see the, uh, uh, the reason to go to the I mean, again. Hopefully, this is uh, clean enough of sort of like the implementation that everybody just sort of uses it. Yeah. Uh, and you just have it. For the throughput demand, it's not <coughs> that high. But there's many, many applications that do have very high demands. So, right, right. so I mean, we're really targeting those. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was giving more of like a, a particular example, but I, for example, of course, so internally at ABA, we're also building, uh, we're trying to build verticals. Um, and a really exciting vertical is insurance products. Um, and so we're looking at a whole lot of insurance products that we can actually deploy. And the way it's going to look, most more likely than not, is going to be a single chain which represents um, um, uh, multitudes of insurance products um, as like tokens, and each one of them, and all of them are running on this one marketplace, which is the one chain. And there's a front-facing API to it and so on, but it's, that one should have a significant amount of demand because you're doing trading of insurance contracts, and people, currently this does not exist by the way. Um, uh, insurance products are not traded on open markets. Uh, there's usually a reinsurer that comes in, creates a contract, creates a reinsurer, and so on. They are inefficient, they are not traded on open markets. We want to entirely open. It's entirely open. So we want to bring that entirely up on chain, and that should have very high uh, performance requirements. Yeah, I just think there's a, you know, I've always seen type insurance as something that's an incredibly efficient market. Super bad, yes. Up, up, up. Yeah. And again, if you're dealing with multiple local, you 
municipalities yeah. that don't follow one another, private insurers end up doing enormous amounts of kind of busy work because a lot of this stuff is layered upon layer. You end, as a consumer, you end up spending a ton of money for title insurance yeah. when in fact, you know, nothing's been disputed for you know decades for a particular property. And uh, so I see that as something that I mean, if you could nationalize that market. Yeah. So this is exactly why I'm very excited about insurance markets. Insurance markets nowadays look like the airplane industry of the 50s and 60s. The margins were very flat for, for airlines. And now margins for airline industries are very within. And it's because uh, we've sort of standardized all, uh, uh, all buying of airplane tickets across multiple search engines. And it's super transparent. And so these margins are super low. We're trying to do the same thing for insurance markets as well. It's a very exciting area. A lot of people brought up title insurance as well. It's a, it's a terrible, terrible system. Yeah. Yes. If you have a market where you need an order book, I yep. would assume you need um, the synchronous snowman implementation as opposed to any synchronous av avalanche implementation? Actually, they can actually both be asynchronous and safe. They could? Yes, yes, okay. they can make them both asynchronous and safe. Um, what that means is that if there's a network partition, nobody makes progress. I was just thinking more along the lines of um, does that drive centralization because all of a sudden people try to co-locate or you know, basically where you are in a network topography becomes much more important. Uh, if it's asynchronous and, and the, the ordering, well, I'm sorry, ordering actually works but you're using an avalanche type Great, of great, um, see, great point. So uh, if you happen to be in a system um, where you're the leader uh, constantly and you accumulate all the words, that exactly would be the case. You co-locate, you become the fastest guy in the, in the space sort of drive centralization towards you. Uh, the rewards are not paid out to the leader directly, they're distributed across the entire state per se. So it doesn't actually matter for you to, to centralize there. I'm thinking more about the nodes that are actually proposing the transaction. So just think about like an equities order book today. I mean, it's some of the uh, highest throughput you would yes. need, but the synchrony is actually very important. So it's almost kind of the worst of both worlds. I'm if you, if you, yeah, if you, um, this is, uh, so, Phil Dian uh, wrote the Flash Voice. Uh, this is a great paper. Uh, he actually works with us on, on building some stuff on top of lava. Uh, um, yes, this is, you know, front running is a big problem and it, uh, it, it, it incentivizes co location. Um, if we build uh, on chain trading uh, uh, products, then this will always be an, an issue. And I, I meant, I mean, I, I will have to think about ways to. So it may be more of a, a settlement than it is an actual trade, where the trading would still potentially be tra uh, centralized, yeah, so, but the settlement is through. So we're building actually a second layer uh, order uh, a matching engine. Uh, the technology to be undisclosed right now uh, is still very, uh, very private, um, which is unfrontable. So you cannot front run it, and it guarantees you unfrontability. Um, so we're, we're building that on top. Interesting. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I still wanted to follow up uh, regarding the, uh, it's like a, the origination of the block production. Yeah. And um, so it seems like there isn't, um, like, since there's no leader, um, there isn't really a, like an extra reward for like, uh, any node that actually proposes a block. Is, is, that, is that correct? Yes. Yes. So is there a possibility that there might be like a like block production would actually um, kind of slow down a little bit because all the other nodes are kind of waiting because they're all waiting for like someone to actually uh, step up and do this block and then this end up absolutely. Working. So in this in this scenario, uh, if the fees being burned are higher uh, than um, uh, the, the cost of you actually generating blocks and generating blocks, which by the way is minimal because all you're doing is just a few round trips across the board, uh, then you have an incentive to gather transactions and push out blocks. So you just have to have more fees burned than the, the total cost of actually generating blocks. And in our system, because you're not super happy to work, the cost of generating blocks is super low. Uh, so it's a, it's a fine calibration. Although we, we are actually considering um, a variant of snowman where the fees are paid out to the leader as well, and you can choose that as your, as your implementation. Um, I'm wary of, uh, of leader-based protocols where fees are paid out to leaders, um, just in general. Uh, but you know, maybe there's like a really interesting sort of uh, round robin like uh, fairness mechanism that allows everybody to be a leader, and 
which case you want to distribute the rewards fairly. Uh, but you know, we haven't uh, we haven't thought about that a lot yet. Yeah. So maybe not necessarily like a leader, but just kind of like a bounty. So whoever um, produces, like whichever like block wins, and whoever produces it get, just gets a little bit on top. Just a way to kind of absolutely like accelerate like uh, some some like choices. Absolutely, yeah. So I'm uh, yeah I'm a, I'm a, uh, sort of engineer and distributed systems person by nature, not economist. I've been thinking about this again, economists on board. These are things that I will have to worry about though, but I will have to be honest with you, I have not thought about these super extensively. Uh, uh, we have a, a dedicated person thinking about these internally and how it should spread. So I need to bring this up with uh, with her at some point. So. Yes. that are governable is a limited set of parameters. So stake in rewards, min stake in time, min stake in amount, max stake in time, max stake in amount. Um, and uh, am I forgetting anything else even? Staking uh, time. Time, yeah, so that's another one governable parameter as well. Um, it would be really interesting. Uh, we have actually thought about something, the notion of a reconfiguration. So like you take the system you currently have and change the runtime completely into a new one. Uh, this is sort of like an order. We have a big board of big to do's, and that's on it. Uh, we haven't gotten to that one yet. Uh, but that is not governable right now. The way that, w that would work is, is more of like a hard fork effectively. So you would shut down the Kaleo sub network, you would just move the entire state to a new one with the new runtime, and make the original one as read only. Or you could just print it out completely and let down the line. So that, that's how we envision it from an engineering perspective. Uh, just getting back to the, this gentleman's question yeah. about. This is base, uh, we, I introduced base engines for consensus, and how do you glue multiple of these guys together? I basically established you the base foundation for like how you would build the internet. All the bad stuff that can happen with it, these are sort of orthogonal, and you, but you do need to account for them. So front running, all these things, um, Snowman or Avalanche are not immune to them. You can, if you were to build a uh, uh, um, trading platform directly, as like a, as a smart contract on Snowman, but then you would uh, you would be you would be open to these to these uh, types of attacks. So what you do is really you want to use other types of technologies and a design that we're considering is sort of the secondary layer uh, um, platform that uses the base one to uh, peg, the base chain to peg into this new uh, uh, layer, and that layer uses a different technology, which is that is undisclosed yet, but that layer will then be unfundable. Did you read the Flash Boys 2.0? I didn't know. Oh, it's a great paper. Definitely should read it. Yeah, 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 sure. Okay. So that you could bribe decentralized exchanges by, by screwing around with the gas price. And so that you would, would front-run the mempool that way. There's all kinds of great stuff. Even, for example, you can do things like if you're the operator of the exchange, and you see a bunch of things happening, you can unplug your machine, like shut down everybody, do your orders first, and then bring everybody back online. It's really hopeful. And they were doing that. Yeah. And they were doing that, exactly right. So. It's really fascinating paper. Yeah, Phil is working with us, and we're working on the second layer thing now, so it's, it's, it's great. You have, to, you have to have slashing, I think, in this scenario. You, you, you have you, to. You don't, actually. There are methods to not to do without slashing. But if the node's publishing the open order book along with its federated That's group a way nodes. To, prevent, uh, to, to prevent this behavior, but the only is there are ways to, to prevent it without using slashing. If, if I can get away without using slashing at all, I'd be very happy. I'm just not a huge, huge fan of it. It's like something will go wrong, man. And uh, everybody will get slashed left and right. Yeah, if something happened, then they did Like somebody like... Yeah, like an AWS configuration. That guy, yes. Didn't they fix it? They went back and forked. Oh, what the hell? Is that... No, if they did that, that's going to be terrible. Did they really do that? I, I saw them push some something recently. Oh, that would be really bad. That's like a centralized system then. Just no, like, no, then... I thought, they, I thought they fixed the bug. I thought they found I, it. I know it. It wasn't a centralized 
if it was a problem with the node uh, running. Like yeah. if they had spinned up two different AWS instances with in the same state and key, then they signed a different block with it. Um, I don't know if they determined that that required a hard fork. Um, so then you would just choose to trade in a dark pool that had slashing if you were philosophically aligned? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, this is like a place within a platform that you could, somebody could build as a, as a plugin, like a chain with these kinds of things, or you can just start using those. So, I mean, the whole principle here is like, do not shove any restrictions down any developer. Everything is sort of uh, free uh, in the sense that you can play them. You can build your own, bring your own functionalities, build your own networks, and uh, but also if you have very nice and, and, and transparent guarantees of security. Like I actually know exactly how much like money went into securing the network. So I can choose sort of like on a sliding scale, do I care about having super high decentralization, which means super high guarantees of security and whatever it may be, or do I not really care, I can dial that down to just go to a small sub-network and implement applications there. So it's like AWS with the sliding scale decentralization. Yes? I have a question that's not related to the consensus for a sure. sure. Uh, what do you have out there for developers looking to start playing around with the network? Yeah, so 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 we're working really heavily on our uh, RPCs right now. Um, so just today, in fact, we've been working a lot on the EVM uh, support for the RPCs, and so uh, so we're hoping to support essentially all of Geth's uh, RPC calls uh, with the EVM prefix. So we're working on that right now. Um, for our own like on the platform, we have our own RPC calls, and uh, we're, we're working a lot on that. Some like graphical vaults and things like that. So there's a very active area of work inside the company on that, but that's kind of the area that we're at. So we're not we're not very far from just wholesale importing Ethereum smart contracts uh, and into it like an Ethereum uh, Ethereum uh, uh, work chain chain. I I might say that that is done, but that might be the future. Okay, but it's very close. Let's yeah, say one right. week. We're one week away from, yeah. from actually you being just able to bring in your smart contracts or your theme smart contracts and just running on chain. Mm -hmm. So that's ready. Uh, but as far as developer needs, any you trust the theory smart contracts? <laughs> I mean, look, I, I do really. Okay, so I've, I've taken some positions that are questionably judgmental of Ethereum on Twitter, and I've been burned for it, and people keep attacking me. Um, like Ethereum trolls keep attacking me. I actually do love uh, Ethereum, I really do. I've been a fan of it for a long time. But it has a bunch of pokey stuff in it. Uh, and uh, the Ethereum virtual machine, it, it does what it does, but it's not really, I, I don't see it surviving long term as like the bytecode that we use. Like it's just not the right one to be able to be used. Kind of scratch it off and uh, do something else. So uh, um, we want to support backwards compatibility for developers. This is a big principle. Again, we like, it's all about developers, giving them the flexibility, giving them the backwards compatibility, allowing them to go wild with their ideas and to build sort of anything they want. And part of that is allowing them to uh, be back to support everything they have already there on the dark platform and get the high throughput and low latency and so on. So uh, um, if you want to do, if you want to continue with getting development on Nava, so be it. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it, but uh, I absolutely support the choice of it. There's no plan at all to make sort of your own smart contract. No, no, we will. So we are we're looking to build a few financial primitives uh, based on uh, solidity based on, on the EVM. Uh, but uh, yeah, we have a lot of um, yeah, we, we have a lot of ideas on things to support on on Ava ETH additionally. But uh, I would love to see more excitement on on Watson just because it's a it's an inch, <coughs> much better bytecode interpreter. So yeah. well, they have uh, eWasm coming up as part of their Yes, yes. Um, I said that as well. A, a, anything besides EPM. Yeah. Uh, so I think they're, they're aware. Yeah, yeah, they don't play. Uh, it's not terrible, but you, know, like, you just can't go very far. So. Cool. Short question from, well, two questions from me. Yeah. So right now we're at the private testnet stage, right? Yes. When is public testnet stage open? Uh, <laughs> we have an internal deadline very soon in what, a week. Uh, but we'll see if we need that. Uh, but we actually are ready to just sort of, so the, the, the Ava testnet is not necessarily going to go live, but we will have uh, the EVM support, like actual, or all of these chains sort of up and running very soon. And so they should look basically undistinguishable from uh, Ethereum to all developers. So these will be public 
and the source code and the code base for these algorithms then, like in, in a few weeks, but probably. Yeah, and I basically see uh, two, two strategies. One is making it very easy for uh, current blockchain developers and Ethereum developers to port yep. things to Alpha. Uh, and the other one is making it as flexible and easy as possible for entry level blockchain developers or normal I, blockchain I would, developers? I would probably say this. The best knowledge that I can provide to this, um, or one of the best ones, is sort of what we currently have is Windows of 2000. And then what we're really trying to build is a sort of hack your own operating system. The same principles that like Linux provides. Linux, you can change anything you want. You can build it, you can, you can hack with it, you can change the internals, you can extend the functionality. As long as you know what you're doing, you can do whatever you want. In these existing systems that we currently see, like blockchains, it's like a very sort of fixed architecture. You can't change anything. The same way that Windows, I think Windows still nowadays is basically unchangeable. Um, so that's really like the target uh, that we're going after. It's like, it's like super hackable. Uh, blockchains that are, that are, that are you know, as long as you know what you're doing, you could be building way more complex things that are currently available on the Ethereum at much higher speeds. So it's faster, more flexible, uh, and all that good stuff. So that's the, that's the <coughs> so it's, I want to say it's still easier, but it's definitely much more flexible. But do you think on top of ABBA there will be like middleware tool suites of built course. on top so we'll make it super easy? Absolutely. Although, to be fair, this is not exclusive to us. Other people will do this as well. Exactly. But we will, of course, spend considerable of the resources to, uh, to make it very easy to use. Uh, so uh, we love you know, fast go to markets. We love just using the already existing things and just putting more we don't want to build our own new thing. So we are ready to give them a new wallet, on our wallet. We have uh, several, we're looking at several other integrations, so uh, I think it should be a pretty good experience pretty soon. So. Good. Okay. Just one question for the audience. Is there someone who is super, super skeptical by nature and wants to express that? Yet skeptical, and why? Because I don't know about your protocol in particular. Yeah. But I mean, these are just tools for all things. I like proof of work. Say again? I like proof of work. Uh, me too. Uh, so, anything else that I hear, I'm going to take, take with a pinch of salt. Okay. Uh, and I do believe this stuff can work. Um, but I'm also more than the proof of stake, proof of work. As I mentioned before, I'm very skeptical of the entire smart contract system currently on Ethereum. Um, and just like, you look at the past of you know any sort of errors that have happened in Ethereum, like money being lost, money being taken, it mostly due to inherent problems in the programming language itself, like reentrancy attacks. Yeah. Uh, like, do smart contracts need to be to smart contract languages need to be Turing complete? Because how much do you actually, as you mentioned before, like a lot of operations you don't actually want to be doing yeah. on a blockchain. Yeah. So why do we need a language that allows all that stuff to actually happen and potentially, can't we just like cut most of the mistakes in that way? So yeah, so some of my team members um, have a bit like you know, conflicting view from yours. I tend to conflict with them, so I tend to be more on your side here. Um, uh, I mean, the whole notion of Ethereum is that, like the world, like the world computer, trying to and everything. It's unclear that this is actually uh, yet needed. But I, there is a, there's a part of me that's optimistic in the sense that we maybe haven't just tapped yet into some applications that do require train completeness and that are going to be really interesting financial primitives. That's one thing. Um, and the second thing, I mean, you have to give it to uh, Ethereum. Uh, um, they have made mistakes because the technology is new, but uh, you know, they've come a very long way. And so it's an exciting area. Uh, I think it's 100% yeah, respectful. Yeah, yeah. It's, it should be. It should be. We should all be skeptical of all the technologies, especially Ava, because it's very much untested. Um, we, we make a lot of claims and we try to back them all up, but ultimately, it's not as tested as Bitcoin. Bitcoin is at 10 years now of testing. Uh, so, we should be skeptical of everything. But uh, new technologies, or rather, better technologies than Ethereum. Let me say this with 100% confidence: do exist. I am. There is no question about it. Do they need testing, but they do exist. And uh, I don't know if Ava is one of them, but I am very confident in my engineering, my knowledge of distributed systems that do exist and they're possible. Uh, so, yeah.
Yeah. yeah, so one interesting uh, thing about that as well is because of our subnet structure, if you don't trust Ethereum, if you don't trust their like the smart contracts to be operated correctly, you don't have to validate for them. You can choose uh, which subnets to validate for them. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, and so the only uh, real key things that you have to validate is the core Abadag and the core uh, staking chain. And aside from that, you can kind of pick and choose what you want to validate. So if you don't like, say, uh, EWASM, or you don't like you know, uh, you know, the EVM, or whatever, whatever uh, you can choose not to validate. Yeah. So you can also build a subnet with proof of work chain on it. You can also build a sub. It's so flexible, you can actually build a, proof, build a subnet with proof of work in it. Uh, it's, it's that flexible. You can hack out basically anything you want. And then run whatever smart contract language you want. Whatever smart contract you want. That's exactly cool. right. So it's just super flexible. It's basically like an interoperability play as well. And the e the Ava virtual machine, the baseline where everybody uh, um, replicates, it's super simple. It's just basic payments. It doesn't shut down anything else. So it's bare bones stuff. It's very lightweight. And it's just basically to allow you know, peer to peer payments. That's it, nothing else. Everything, all the other additional functionalities, you can add them on top into something that works with their own virtual machine and so on. So it's, uh, it's by far the most like what I like to say, it's by far the only system that I've seen that shuts absolutely nothing down anybody's throat. It's just very, very sort of transparent by itself. Any questions? Yeah.